we will continue with Professor Trede from Germany, from Mannheim, and he, of course, will give you already more introduction to what we are going to work on today. That is this working session on the SIP recommendations for indicators for evidence-based indicators of a good chronic pain management. And I look very much forward to hear now what the expert group has already prepared in some way beforehand and uh, what should be then the basis for our discussion today. So please, Rolf Detlef. Yeah, thank you very much, Hans, for the kind introduction. So we're doing this in a slightly reversed order. And I interpret this uh, to the point that we have to spend time or pass time in one way or the other. And therefore, I would like to make two comments that were not planned. One comment is uh, from an international perspective. I'm, since last year, a member of the executive committee of the IASP. And I think what everybody in this room should keep in mind is that the European Federation of Pain Societies is in a unique position. Everybody can influence healthcare policy in their own country, but we have another level that we can jointly address, which is situated here in Brussels. And I think this is very significant, and this is why I think the SIP initiative that Alberto Grua pointed out, the history of, is an extremely important one and probably unique in the world. And this also is, uh, means that we have to get our work done so that people can see what we can do and maybe copy it, but we have to do our work first. The other thing that I found interesting is that the month of May is, in this year, is the EU month of brain research, month of the brain. And there are lots of activities going on currently in other buildings around here about uh, research funding for brain research. Where one of the topics this morning actually has been uh, whether research, in brain research in this case, should be directed by opportunity or by need. And uh, I think in this room we all agree that both go hand in hand. And when it's about uh, pain, clearly there is a societal need. This is where this uh, title, Societal Impact of Pain, comes from. But we also have very eminent pain researchers in Europe, in many countries, that uh, do their work funded by national agencies, by pain societies, and also by the EU. And coincidentally, as Hans Kress mentioned, this idea of pain as a disease, at least in the chronic situation, it's clear that it's an entity in its own right. This morning at this uh, EU uh, Commission meeting, uh, there was material handed out where they had a list of neurological diseases, and pain was on that list. <laughs> so. In some context, I think uh, we have already carried the message across that uh, there's a research ag agenda, which is part of brain research, but also, which is the topic today, we have this agenda of addressing the needs of society. So that was the unplanned introduction. Peter isn't here yet, so I think I continue with the planned part. So you see my conflict of interest up there, and it's about quality indicators on, in chronic pain management. Um, Hans Kress already mentioned that uh, two years ago we had this roadmap, uh, uh, the SIP roadmap for action, which had seven domains. And five of them actually are oriented towards individual countries. So many of you have worked on these five domains in your country. We have now uh, the second edition of the roadmap monitor. Data is being uh, validated actually. Uh, that's the current state where we are. But this process left open the two dimensions that we felt two years ago should be covered on a European level. And this is what's being targeted uh, today and tomorrow. And here today we want uh, to look basically at ways to improve the quality of life of European citizens. So this is actually taken from the final statement of uh, this meeting two years ago. That's the aim. And in order to, to reach this aim, we have to be able to monitor the trends. And therefore, we look at quality indicators. 
Now, there are two aspects to it that I would like to mention as an introduction. So at the previous SIP meetings, I think many of us agreed that pain or pain relief should be a quality indicator for the entire healthcare system. So cardiologists' quality of care, neurologists' quality of care, in oncology, and so further and so on, should, among other things, be judged by the quality of pain relief that they're providing, because pain relief is a parameter of quality of life. Only when we talk about pain as our primary endpoint, we say there are other parameters that we call quality of life. But for normal people, pain relief actually is part of the quality of life aspect. So we should not forget that clearly pain relief or the amount of pain and, and the structures behind it should be an indicator for the healthcare systems in general. And I think some of the southern European countries have made quite a bit of a progress in declaring these things aims of the national policy. I'm usually way behind in my list of countries that have this policy, so I apologize to everybody who's not on that list. I think several other countries have joined. So what we're here today uh, to do is to look at basically the quality of what we can provide. So we're really looking into the mirror and say, what is it that we can do and how can we monitor the quality of what pain physicians or also general practitioners who provide pain care to, to people can deliver. So we look for quality indicators for pain management. And this is very important. We should start with ourselves and be able to declare what the parameters are that people should measure to check our performance. And then I think from there on we can broaden that perspective and then advocate this to be used for healthcare systems in general. When we talk about pain management, there's a broad spectrum. Again, uh, the previous speaker had shown this long list which only covered some of the diagnosis involved in neuropathic pain, which is only one part of the chronic non-cancer pain. Um, we have chronic cancer pain, which is a different situation because there's an overlap with palliative care where cancer pain is, plays a major role, but also other symptoms that are being relieved. And for pain medicine, to treat cancer pain is also one of the aspects. And therefore, cancer pain is always listed separately. The two have in common that they're chronic conditions, and chronic pain is where, in theory, we say pain has lost its warning function. It's a good theory, but hard to test. And therefore, we usually have operational definitions of, for example, pain outlasting a normal healing process, or what has been very successful, psychosocial indicators that have shown, that can demonstrate that pain has acquired uh, properties of a disease condition of its own right. We should not forget that many chronic pain conditions start with acute pain. So in particular in the post-surgical field, people have spent a lot of attention to the situation of acute pain treatment. There has been a big European project, Pain Out, that had received funding that I think uh, stopped last year, but the project still exists. And they demonstrated that I think 10 or 20 percent of patients leaving surgical wards still have pain. This doesn't mean that it's chronic pain, it just means that it outlasts the normal care in the hospital, so they are being sent back home to normal treatment. So post-surgical acute pain probably is, is also part of the problem. However, today we will end up focusing on the chronic non-cancer pain as uh, the biggest challenge because it's so diverse and uh, the suffering that it causes is uh, very substantial. So what did we do? So the starting point was supposed to have been presented to you by Peter Saturno already. Plataforma Sin de Law, which was basically an effort in Spain that went through the literature to look at possible indicators, then went through a validation process that I hope we will hear a little bit later, and came up with a list of indicators. And then for, for the SIP uh, focus group, a group of experts from a number of countries uh, that included Petro Saturno here, looked at these indicators and commented them in two ways. We gave ratings to the perceived importance of what the Spanish group had developed and pilot tested in three different settings in their country. And we also came up with additional indicators and tried to have a rating and selection. Now, 
it, as it turned out in this process, uh, you did receive material of the preliminary status of this process, but it's not a paper that we ask you to sign. It's very much work in progress. And I think you will see why it is work in progress when I go through the next couple of slides. So, oops, uh, wrong one, this one here. So this is uh, basically taken from the list of the indicators from the Spanish uh, uh, project. You see the average ratings given in this column here, and you see some of the papers that can be quoted to provide the evidence that these uh, are meaningful parameters. So we have different types of indicators. The so structure indicators in general, for example, the existence of a national pain strategy received a high rating. And national pain strategies have been published in several countries. Also, the existence of guidelines for diagnosis and treatment uh, was considered to be very important as a structural indicator. And the idea to have a multidisciplinary approach to treating for chronic pain. So these would be structural indicators. And where we reach consensus is that these certainly are necessary conditions to start from. And we're not sure whether this list is complete, but the idea is that these are necessary conditions to start from. But then in order to improve patient care, it's not enough to just uh, twiddle these little knobs here, but other things have to happen. And here the Spanish list continues and looks as process indicators. Some of them are general, for example, whether the multidimensional approach is actually being used. Um, they identified that communication between different healthcare providers is very important, both to improve healthcare and to cut cost, because if communication is poor, things tend to be repeated over and over again, and mostly it's the non-efficient ones that are being re repeated because they haven't been successful, the next person thinks they must be the next time around. So communication, as always, is a very important point. And then, I'm very happy to, to have seen, I didn't know the presentation by Dr. O'Hara, beforehand, but that delays seem to be very important factors. There's some evidence that delays may actually have an effect, and time between the onset of pain and the commencement of adequate treatment has been identified as one parameter. I think one factor in that was also that um, there is this word, I think it doesn't exist in English, chronifizierung, so how pain becomes chronic is considered to be a process that does take time. Not the same amount of time in everybody, but the longer you wait, uh, the, the worse your chances of, of getting better. So therefore, this is an important parameter on that. We're still in the process indicator section. And what I think is quite important, and I suggest that you keep in mind, is that there are many, many different types of pain. And therefore, when we want to improve the process of uh, pain care, we should look at the different conditions and see what is specific to the different conditions. There can be some common denominators, but a priori, we are not sure whether they are common denominators. For example, in the headache field, for some reason, only this one parameter survived, which addresses the substance abuse headache, which is by no means the only type of headache, but it's actually a very important headache problem when you talk to pain clinicians, because these are the patients that they see. It's not the most frequent situation for GPs, but uh, clearly for the pain clinics. Then for non-specific low back pain, so those low back pains where you don't have a simple uh, reason like uh, narrow spine canal, education and analgesic treatment, which are taken from some of the guidelines. In Germany, there's a national guideline for low back pain treatment, which has, in particular, treatment modalities that are active from the perspective of the patient, plus uh, some of the medical treatments that have good evidence. Those are listed. We have rheumatoid arthritis listed here, and fibromyalgia. And again, these recommendations here are clearly taken from existing guidelines, and the existing guidelines are based on randomized controlled trials, meta-analyses, and all the types of evidence that we have in medicine. Neuropathic pain, I think I'm a little bit responsible for lumping this. Um, there are certainly a number of different diagnoses, and for some reason or the other, all the central pains 
somehow dropped off this list. So this clearly is an incomplete list. Diabetic neuropathy is clearly, by, in terms of numbers, by far the most prevalent. Trigeminal neuralgia may be among the most uh, difficult ones, or the most uh, intense ones. But clearly, neuropathic pain needs a specific type of treatment. There are guidelines for it, and sometimes they're followed, sometimes they're not. And then prevention of chronic pain, a very important issue. So if you want uh, to make sure that chronic pain becomes less frequent, treating it is good, but preventing it is probably better. Now, if you want to really collect evidence that any of these processes works, we have to have agreement on what the outcome parameters are. So outcome indicators can't really have an evidence base because they are taken a priority as the things that we, we as a group, as society, whoever, decide as being important. And what we came up with is at least two parts that are also alluded to in the beginning. Clearly when we talk about pain, pain relief, either quantified as the level of pain remaining being below a tolerable level, which on the 0 to 10 scale could be below 4, or it could be a certain percentage of change. And the reference that you see here, Dworkin and others of the impact group, had collected from a number of studies data supporting the point of view that if you get a 30% decrease in pain, that is considered significant from a patient perspective and is therefore also used in clinical trials as endpoint nowadays. The other thing that we should never forget is that although pain relief is a, an aspect, one aspect of quality of life, there are other aspects like sleep, sleep quality, um, everyday life, um, the level of anxiety, depression, and so further and so on. So clearly, at least these two things have to be looked at, pain relief and other aspects of quality of life. Now, this is basically a distillation from the Spanish pilot project that you will hopefully hear in a more extensive version somewhat later. We also um, discussed within uh, the panel of experts what a list of outcome indicators would have to look like. And here uh, is the result of that discussion. So one aspect to start from is structure indicators, about infrastructures and tools that need to be available to provide a service. And these are absolutely necessary conditions, so if you don't have anybody trained in treating pain, nobody will probably treat pain. So it's a starting point. Clearly, it's not a sufficient condition. So you can have many people trained in treating pain. If they don't get referral of the patients that need the treatment, it won't work. And it's sad to say, but I think I should emphasize this, if these people are not paid for treating people in pain, then they may go on and do other parts of medicine, as is happening to a certain degree in Germany, where neurologists then treat maybe neurological disorders and anesthesiologists do anesthesia or emergency care. Now this is a starting point. What's very important, where I look forward to hearing more from the Spanish pilot project, is what process indicators have been developed uh, for Spain, because this is what, where probably the action will take place. So you start with a certain structure, but then you have to take actions. And this is what process indicators uh, can look like. Is it enough to measure pain? It's not enough to have a guideline, but you have to use a guideline. Uh, patient education and so further and so on have been listed as potential process indicators. And from my perspective, I look very much forward to the discussion at, at this meeting that we can have about structure indicators, process indicators. And also, maybe that will be a starting point, what will be the outcome indicators? Because they will inform us on how good we are. So I think it's probably even a starting point for the discussion. What is the intended outcome that we aim for? And we aim for pain relief better pain relief in Europe for all the European citizens. And that's here. But clearly, quality of life, ability to either work or go about daily activities will also play a role. And uh, from my perspective, I think it's very important to come to some kind of an agreement what the recommended outcome indicators will be. 
because the choice of outcome indicators will certainly have a major effect on the validation of any process indicator that we will then look at. And therefore, I think this is very important to keep in mind. The experts, this is getting to the final slide, were also asked to give a perspective from their own country view. And this is what I tried to do uh, the other day, is to sort indicators that were given in everybody's own version of English. And some said, well, we would like to have indicators. And some countries' representatives reported, we have indicators. So all countries reported that indicators are important. But for some, I personally could not distill whether they would be structure, process, or, quali or outcome quality indicators. So my idea is that this could be one possible starting point for a discussion on structure, process, and outcome indicators. So we have pain outcome, which has been listed by, by some of the countries. Quality of life, where in particular our UK colleagues have been very specific in uh, having apparently introduced in, in their system one particular indicator or one particular assessment tool to, to measure this. And also the waiting times have reappeared as outcome indicators, which uh, I look forward to the discussion about, because from a patient perspective, maybe the waiting time is already an outcome. Although I, I personally look at pain relief and quality of life, uh, the waiting time clearly plays a major role for anxiety, for, for many uh, other factors. Um, you can see here in the structural indicators, which are the starting point, existence of national pain plans has been listed by many countries as being important independent of whether or not that country has that plan already. Yeah? Just whether it's considered important. Um, education, we found education here as core curricula, as number of physicians with a diploma or certified pain teams. And we also have some quantitative parameters that uh, seem to indicate the density of pain specialists per inhabitant, which can be quantified one way or the other. For the process, uh, Standardized assessment probably is, is a very good point to look at because if you don't assess pain, you will never notice that it's present unless it's very strong. So patients that have very strong pain will mention it no matter what. But patients with moderate pain, it depends on their motivational state and their level of anxiety in the treatment condition, whether they will report it or not. So clearly assessment is a good starting point, but then we have to have some kind of national guidelines, practice recommendations, and we will have to have the teams that can put them into action. So we have a list here of things that we could discuss. And this was supposed to be the end before this one minute break, before you actually should have had this opportunity to discuss. So I think I pass this on now to Hans Kress or Bertolt Klasnitsch to to guide us how this will continue now. Thank you very much for your attention.